Welcome to this afternoon's invited lectures session. I'm Damien Roussan uh, from Berkeley Lab, and I'll be chairing the session. Our speaker for the, this, the first of this afternoon's invited talks is Dr. Sandra Diaz Pierre. Sandra was born in Mexico City, has a bachelor's degree in electronic systems engineering, and a master's degree in computer science with a concentration on quantum computing, as well as a master's degree in electronics engineering, and a PhD in computer science focusing on computational neuroscience. Sandra is the scientific leader of the Simulation and Data Lab, Neuroscience at the Ulick Supercomputing Center at Forschungszentrum Ulick, Germany. Her research focus is on high performance computing, simulation of brain dynamics and plasticity across a range of scales, and optimization. She collaborates on the implementation of the infrastructure derived from the Human Brain Project, eBrains. She was also a member of the High Level Support Steering Committee and is active in the technical coordination and education program of the project. Her contributions to open source software include the Nest Neural Network Simulator. Today, Sandra will talk about boosting neuroscience research with high performance computing infrastructure. Sandra. So, hello everybody. Uh, thank you so much, Damien, for the introduction. And uh, first of all, it's an honor to be here today. Thanks so much to uh, Professor Gilles, who invited me to take part on this amazing conference and to share with you why um, I got to HPC. I want to share with you a little bit of my journey. And also, I want to share with you how uh, during the last years, we have been boosting neuroscience research with high performance computing in the context of the Human Brain Project and the European uh, flagship project. So, well, let's get started. First of all, I want to get you into my journey. How did I uh, get into HPC? So, this is me. Uh, <laughs> This, uh, the little one with the curls, and this is my family, so that's my sister, my father, and my mother. I was uh, very lucky to be born in a house uh, with lots of love and encouragement. And uh, my dad, he is an electronics engineer, a classic analog electronics engineer. <laughs> and uh, he always motivated us to uh, dig into questions, into scientific questions, into innovation, and of course also to find solutions for things. He was a pioneer in Mexico in biomedical engineering, and that inspired me a lot uh, during my early years. I wanted to be like him, I wanted to do uh, also engineering, and at some point I got really, really fascinated by the brain. So. Uh, for me, it was really a question, how does that work? How can I understand its mechanisms? And I was always very, very focused. Since I was little, I had um, an objective, and I knew that I was passionate also about technology. So I decided to address this curiosity, not from the more traditional, let's say, side, where you would maybe naturally just study medicine or biology. Um, no, I decided to go on the tech side. <laughs> so um, I was good in math, and uh, I was encouraged to move through the, through the path of engineering. So I was very set on getting an uh, electronics engineering uh, degree and then trying to find ways to understand the brain through technology, how to connect the brain to technology. Um, so everything was fine. Um, in Mexico, the economic situation was not so great when I was young. So I got a, a scholarship to be able to get to the university. 
And my plan was going, let's say, kind of okay. I got my bachelor's degree in electronics engineering. First step done. But then, of course, I wanted to go all the way to become a researcher, to really do uh, an impactful thing. So the path went all the way to get a PhD and do real research, right? However, it's said that life is what happens while you are making plans, right? So <laughs> my plan was that one, <laughs> but life surprised me with a wonderful gift. Um, and this is my gift. <laughs> Uh, my son was born um, just when I was finalizing my bachelor's degree. And um, at that point, I was uh, a single mom with a kid and uh, a very <laughs> interesting goal in my mind. However, um, I decided, of course, to change priorities, right? Of course, he was priority number one. I had to make sure that he was safe that he had a good environment where to grow, and that I could provide for him. So instead of just going the <laughs> natural, dedicating myself off full study, I started working as a uh, developer, as a software developer, and um, that made gave me the opportunity to provide for him. And then in parallel, I wanted to keep pursuing my dream, right? So I enrolled to a master's degree in computer science. I was very fascinated by everything that had to do with the latest technology, um, optimization, anything that could bring me a step closer to this dream of creating bridges, understanding the complexity of the brain and the human body. So I was working full time and also attending classes. And then every hour that he was awake, I was with him. Every hour that he was sleeping, I was studying or crashing. <laughs> but it worked. Uh, it finally uh, worked and I got my master's in computer uh, science. And it was a wonderful achievement. I don't know really, today I cannot imagine myself doing the same thing. Uh, I guess it was love power and passion power that kept me <laughs> going throughout these years. And that is um, really great. So then I was uh, given a great opportunity uh, I could pursue a PhD in Canada. And I said, sure, let's go together. It's not my journey anymore, it's our journey, my son and I's journey, so let's move to Canada. And you see the face of my son there? That was exactly how we felt when we got there. We had never seen snow before. <laughs> it was super cold. Uh, but it was amazingly exciting, and uh, we went all in for the adventure. And, and there I, I could study. Um, the idea was to make first a two-year master in electronics engineering and then get a PhD on biomedical engineering on top of it after three years. Unfortunately, again, life put some things on the way, and the program never opened in the university where I was. I was living in Thunder Bay at that time. And my option was to move to Toronto to finalize my PhD. But you know, living on a PhD scholarship in a very expensive city like Toronto, being a single mom is extremely hard. So at that point, I decided to say, okay, this will not work. I will not be able to provide the environment that I would like for my son. So maybe this is the end. I mean, maybe I just have to give up and find a nice job in industry and just let it be. So I started looking for a job. <laughs> and amazingly, um, I found out that there was an opening for a research position in Germany for um, 
position that was combining high performance computing and neuroscience. And I was like, this is like my dream job. I need to apply for it. And I did. And I don't know how, but I guess it was meant to be. Um, they said, okay, yeah, uh, we want you here. So again, we moved <laughs> this time all the way to Germany for our next adventure. And uh, I can say today that now uh, I found, uh, we found our home in Germany. I found my husband, uh, my today's husband, and the three of us, that's my son, the, the little one now, he's 19 years old, <laughs> he's a man now. And, um, and we are quite excited to be there. And uh, this is how I, became HPC. I joined the Simulation and Data Lab Neuroscience at the Julius Super Computing Center in Germany, where I can really enjoy working in the interface between HPC and neuroscience, supporting scientific use cases and requirements, and providing solutions on the HPC side. So today I can say I am HPC. Um, when I, oh my, this is a little bit small, I don't know why, but um, when I arrived to Germany, um, there was also a very interesting thing happening at the same time. Uh, there was, in 2013, uh, the start of the Human Brain Project, this flagship project that aimed at creating a research infrastructure for, for, the brain, for brain research. And many people think that the Human Brain Project is a neuroscience project, but it is not. Um, the Human Brain Project was a technology project. It was driven by the technology side of the European Commission. And the goal was really to create tools and services, infrastructure and uh, consolidate um, data um, elements that could support brain research. So at that point, when I joined the Simulation and Data Lab, uh, it was uh, just this beginning for the Human Brain Project. And there, was, uh, there were lots of expectations about what could be done using uh, supercomputing with the brain. But what was clear was that neuroscience was really in its infancy in using high performance computing. So at some point we realized that things have to be done in a very tight co-design between the different areas of neuroscience and the engineering side, the supercomputing side, the software engineers, and everybody uh, who wanted to make this ICT infrastructure a reality. So this, of course, needed a very multidisciplinary uh, effort and this was then the start of the journey for the neuroscience community on becoming HPC, at least in Europe. And this is just, uh, there's, these are just a few of the many uh, fields of research that are involved in the neuroscience. And they go all the way from the neuroanatomy to neurorobotics, from ethics to psychology. I mean, there are so many different aspects of neuroscience. And as you well know, I, um, one of the most essential things in the brain, as well on a supercomputer, is the network, the connectivity. And this is what the Human Brain Project became the core element that united all these efforts to co-design this research infrastructure and where people could then exchange information and develop a common language. At some point it was even surprising that for somebody, um, some researcher, the word connectivity had a completely different meaning to, to what uh, for us in the HPC side, or the word node, or the word many things were just completely different in the different fields. So just starting to take a, and create a common language was a challenge. Um, 
So the original plan of the Human Brain Project was to make a procurement for a very large supercomputer that would enable all this research to happen somehow. However, it became evident that the HPP community needed more urgently something like um, infrastructure for data, for data storage, for data management, and also cloud resources. And these requirements uh, then changed the original plan. And the new plan was set in place in 2016 with the creation of the Interactive Computing e Infrastructure for the HBP project called the IC. So this project um, moved the plan into this. Uh, a cre the, to create a research infrastructure supported by different supercomputing centers. In this case, five of the leading supercomputing centers in Europe joined forces, so ULIS, CEA, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, CSCS, and Chineca. And together we created a joint effort to provide this new kind of more flexible supercomputing infrastructure that neuroscience required. And the other thing is um, we started a federation effort. So a way in which users could access these resources in an easier way without having to like have a user for each of these supercomputing centers and learn how to use each of them in a different way and learn to deploy their jobs in a different way and port their code to the different systems. So there was this need for a let's say, layer of homogeneity between the different centers. And this was a tremendous effort. So uh, I really would like to say thank you to all my colleagues at the different centers, because this was really a, a joint effort of understanding the requirements of the community and translating them into something useful and uh, accessible to all scientists have to keep in mind that most of these scientists were not computer experts. They are, many are experimentalists. Some of them are medical doctors. Some of them are ethicists. So most of them don't really want to invest too much time learning how to access the supercomputer and deploy jobs, but they would still love to get additional information about how a patient will react to a specific therapy for uh, brain uh, disease. So this is what we aimed for, easy, uh, easy access to a super powerful uh, computing infrastructure. So the first elements that were procured were these HPC pilot systems, Yulia and Euron. So they were named for the glia cells and the neurons <laughs> in the brain. And um, these two systems were meant to provide uh, a base to test which platforms would be better to support the algorithms and the programs, the software that was already available for neuroscience and in which ways. And there was lots of mm, development here, new strategies for data storage, new elements that could connect easy, uh, easier cloud compute with HPC infrastructure. And of course, there were also a lot of innovation in terms of procedures, how to make access to all the HBP members easy without lengthy proposals and uh, how to, to make this work. At that point, the Human Brain Project was divided into six platforms, each of them concentrating on one of the niche uh, elements of neuroscience in the project. So it was neuroinformatics, brain simulation, uh, high performance analytics and computing, the medical informatics platform, the neuromorphic computing, and neurobotics. And um, these platforms evolved through time. So by um, 2018, there was the official launch of the research infrastructure derived from the Human Brain Project. This e research infrastructure is called eBrains, and today it's still the output, the, one of the main outputs of the Human Brain Project. In 2019, we decided to create an entity 
that would serve as a, an element to continue uh, the efforts around the research infrastructure. And this is the IBRIS AISBL, which is founded um, in, in Brussels. And this gave an, uh, an anchoring element also to propose IBRIS as part of the European Research Roadmap. In 2022, uh, IBRIS started with a new concept. It's divided itself into national nodes in the sense of funding because um, this uh, flagship project from the EC lasted for 10 years, but the funding, of course, was ended just last September, and then new ways of funding needed to be uh, accessible or made accessible to continue the research infrastructure. So in this sense, the national nodes provide national funding to different parts of the research infrastructure for it to move forward. This is what eBrains looks like today. It is uh, a, a little bit different from the original six platforms. So we have an area dedicated to data where re researchers can um, submit their data, find new data, um, and really find the standards for uh, different aspects of the compute. Um, then there is the brain atlases. So there was a very big effort to create atlases of the brain at different scales that would provide important data for simulation and analysis and understanding how the brain changes through time. Then there's modeling and simulation and compute validation and inference, and of course the health research platforms which are becoming more and more required because handling sensitive data or personal data for healthcare is really difficult, especially in the context of high performance computing. There's lots of things regarding data protection and safety ethics and uh, things that have to be complied with legally to make things work. So now, um, this, the video is not, uh, oh yes, it is, okay, perfect. So I'm gonna sh tell you just a few of the big things that moved or really managed to get fully HPC during these uh, 10 years. And one of them is the Brain Atlas. So I already mentioned this is this um, detailed set of da um, data at different scales that provides you like a map of how the brain works and tells you, uh, for example, counts of different types of cells, of different types of uh, connectivity, and um, different elements that are present in different regions of the brain. And this information uh, is uh, consolidated into a 3D visualization that um, the users can really interact with, navigate to get the data that they need. And they also have access programmatically to this information so that they can introduce this data into models and other tools for further analysis, for AI, for simulation of brain dynamics, etc. The second point that really got uh, into uh, high performance computing, of course, was modeling, simulation, and computing. And here we, of course, address the dynamics of the human brain at many different scales. So we have all the way from the molecular and subcellular level from, to the cellular level, the network level, and the whole brain level. And for each of these scales, we have dedicated simulators that allow uh, scientists to study the dynamics of the brain. There's something beeping outside. <laughs> Sorry? Okay, perfect. <laughs> Very good, okay. Let's hope it's nothing serious. <laughs> but in the meantime, <laughs> I can uh, maybe tell you a little bit more about this. So, okay. 
okay an alarm has been triggered okay okay <laughs> Then we will uh, remain calm uh, with neuroscience. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so uh, modeling and simulation. Um, we have all these different scales, and one of the interesting co-design experiments that happened during the Human Brain Project was that we sat down and said, okay, we have many simulators that have existed for a long time, and that are adopted by many scientists already. But our technology in terms of high performance computing is advancing all the time. And now we have GPUs and accelerators of different kinds. And how about if we design a, sim a simulator that can really take advantage of this hardware from the ground, from the design? And this is what we did with Arbor. So Arbor is a simulator of um, morphologically detailed neurons. You have all the dynamics of the cells represented along the uh, dendritic and axon, uh, dendritic trees and the axons. And one of the nice things about Arbor is that it is really optimized to run on the most high-end uh, supercomputing infrastructure. It, is, it was also designed to be a benchmark for new supercomputing procurement. And uh, today, for example, uh, we have simulations with Arvo that can fill one of our, our biggest supercomputing units, as that's uh, the US booster, and it has around 900 um, GPUs. Uh, we can fill them completely with a very nice uh, scaling. So, this co-design uh, effort led to also providing requirements for the HPC designers and vendors to address some of the challenging compute uh, that is required to study the brain at this level of detail. We also have these very nice data-driven models that emerged from a human brain project. So these are models of different regions of the brain, the basal ganglia, the hippocampus, the cerebellum. And these models really contain hundreds of thousands of neurons, each of them with tens of thousands of connections, many of them with plasticity rules that explain how learning or adaptation takes place in these different parts of the brain. And these simulations are done with Neuron, one of the most um, popular uh, software frameworks uh, in neuroscience at this scale. And they really uh, are able to take up and um, leverage the HPC power available even today. Of course, um, if you simulate something and you don't see the result, it's very difficult to understand what is going on. So visualization was also a very important part of the Human Brain Project, where we wanted to really make information available to the researchers so that they could identify, for example, here, how waves propagate through the hippocampus when a stimuli is uh, inserted in different parts of it. Another simulator that was very much developed and able to uh, take the supercomputing power uh, available is Nest. So here is an example of um, a network of spiking neurons where the neurons are not represented with their whole morphology, but they are now just abstracted as points in space. A very smart points, but <laughs> still points in space. And um, these are very large models that can take up millions of neurons with many, many uh, thousands of millions of, um, of synapses. And they can really reproduce some of the effects, for example, here in the visual cortex of the macaque. Uh, and uh, they allow us to understand how visual input can be passing for different stages in the brain. And 
also in, uh, in the spirit of the co-design, we had this need for uh, interacting a little bit more with the simulations. What is going on with these large simulations of the brain? Neuroscientists were not so used to um, leaving something there and then analyze the data. They wanted to really grasp what is going on at, at the time when the simulation was happening and to be able to react to it. And for this, for example, we had tests where we deployed very large networks and we were uh, feeding the output directly to some interactive visualization and the researchers could tune different parameters of the simulation on real time so that they could find the right parameters for the simulations without having to restart over and over uh, with different setups. Another nice example is Nest Desktop. This is a visual environment where uh, researchers with no programming experience can design experiments and then uh, launch their simulations on HPC and get the results back and visualize them very easily. And another very prominent example of HPC applications was um, on the more clinical neuroscience. So here we have the example of the Bayesian virtual epileptic patient. This uh, setup where we have multimodal experimental data integrated into a brain model and then tuned on high performance computing infrastructure to find the suitable dynamical uh, activities. This is the Colorado Convention Center. We are, uh, we are given the all clear, the cause of the fire alarm has been give, uh, investigated and been given permission to return all systems back to normal. We're all clear now. Attention ladies and gentlemen, this is the Colorado Convention Center. The fire department has invested the cause of the fire alarm and has given permission to return all systems back to normal. All clear. Excellent. So, yes, this, um, this simulation workflow, which integrates data and goes through the modeling, simulation, optimization, and HPC, and then all the way to creating patient specific uh, information that the clinicians can use to decide if they proceed with a specific treatment or not, is really one of the hallmarks of uh, what was generated during the HVP. And um, for example, this is uh, something that was uh, already implemented in a clinical trial in France, and we are waiting for the actual results on what happens with this additional information that was provided to, re to clinicians. Uh, sorry. Yes. No, I skip one. Okay. Um, and of course, what we want is also to make things easy for the researchers, as I said. So we also create domain specific languages that would allow neuroscientists to express their questions in a high level language and then automatically generate code that could be run on GPUs and get a high performance on uh, simulations of whole brain dynamics, for example, here is um, this domain-specific language is called RateML, but we have domain-specific languages for many of the different uh, scales at what the brain can be described on. And of course, the multi-scale brain has to be addressed in a multi-scale fashion, so um, the HPP also put a lot of effort on co-simulation in that meant basically having different simulators for each of these scales 
uh, working in parallel at different parts of a supercomputer, for example, different sections of the supercomputer, and then exchanging information between them. This was an extremely challenging scientific problem and technical problem because uh, exchanging different information between scales is definitely not trivial, but also making this robust enough for actual scientific use cases was not trivial. So this is a continued effort and something that we want to move forward. I'm gonna try to speed a little bit because we, we lost a bit of time with the alarm, but I wanted also to, to tell you about the relationship that exists between neuroscience and AI. So uh, it's a very bidirectional bi relationship. There is, of course, AI that can be applied for neuroscience. And how do you classify data? How do you do uh, image detection um, but, or, or robotics? But there is also the other side, and how neuroscience knowledge can influence the design of new algorithms in AI. So here's just a few examples of um, our optimization tools guided with machine learning on HPC, that's uh, learning to learn on that side. And here on this side, this is the um, neurorobotics platform where we had brains completing tasks uh, with the simulated robots on real environments and with a, within a closed loop to understand how the brain behaves in real environments. Um, and of course, on the, on the side of algorithms for AI, um, there was a lot of effort on creating energy efficient, for example, image processing algorithms that use spiking neural networks instead of the traditional um, uh, artificial neural networks uh, to do tasks, for example, like uh, just uh, detection of uh, numbers or letters or images. And one point that I don't want to miss, of course, is that not everything was just traditional uh, HPC. We also en entered into the design of new hardware architectures inspired by the brain. This is what we call neuromorphic hardware. And within the Human Brain Project, we had these two systems, the Spinnaker and Brain Scales, which tried to mimic the workings of the brain in order to do compute. I'm so sorry, I'm just gonna take a few more minutes to finalize. So I just want to say that uh, even the HPP is now over, but eBrains will continue. And we hope that uh, it will, of course, continue to provide the research infrastructure to the scientific community. Everybody can be part of eBrains. You can register and get an account in eBrains and you can access all the information, the data, the showcases that are available there. And of course, we are preparing for the exascale machine so, uh, that we, have, we will have in Ulish. So uh, this is another challenge, how to prepare all the codes that are ready to address the exascale challenge now. Um, after all this that I've shown you on how the HPP addressed and leveraged HPP, HPC, I can tell that we are HPC. Well, these are just a few more pictures. And that one is my son over there. He's always, he was always going around the HBP summits and things, playing with robots, and he was, he's full HPC and HBP and everything. <laughs> Some more images. And um, the last thing, uh, of course, we encourage a lot the role of women in uh, HPC. Um, I am so proud of being part of the group in Yulish, uh, where we have many women being part of uh, the HPC endeavor, and we always look uh, for mentoring young women to give their best and join the HPC world and become HPC. <laughs> that is my group. So. Thanks to my group, uh, the SEL Neuroscience, and thanks to all my friends, colleagues, and collaborators of the HVP. It has been a wonderful joint endeavor to become uh, HVC. Thank you for your attention.
Okay, thank you, Sandra. And we do have uh, five minutes for questions. Um, and I want to say thank you first for a great talk, but also for your crisis management skills and your calm in the midst of a, of a crisis. <laughs> uh, we have one question from the room here. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for a very inspiring uh, presentation. Uh, I'd like to say that uh, your personal story was exciting and impressive, and I would hope that it would be exposed to as many students here at SC as possible to inspire them to what can be done. <laughs> takes grit, takes uh, commitment to your goal, and a lot of good luck as well, but Absolutely. it can be done if you want to do it. And the more students that understand that, the more success we'll have. Absolutely, uh, thank I, you. I did want to make a second point. I was impressed by the fact that H, HPB, HBP, early on in this century had to learn that simple supercomputer was not all they needed in order to do yeah. real work. They needed infrastructure, they needed a lot of data and the management of that data, and that's an important message for everyone in the 21st century. My technical question is, Thank you. HPB and eBrains yeah. is very focused on the physical structure and behavior of the brain. Yes. I would hope that as they develop better understanding of the physical mechanisms, they would also include exploration and study of the emotional personality and other less mechanistic things that go on in the human brain so that we could understand those also. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Absolutely. Um, there is a lot of effort now to move towards the under better understanding of consciousness, for example. So we have a specific metrics that allow us to say, for example, if we are conscious or unconscious, but this is still at the mechanistic level, as you say. And we have to move uh, towards the next level and uh, find ways to understand if a system that is complex enough and it's representing the dynamics that we manage to observe, measure, and understand in the brain can give birth to this higher level function that is so complex and that we are definitely still not ready to uh, understand and address. But we are very interested on it and we are all for it. Um, there is also, of course, the mental health uh, point is really important and it is something that we really want to address by uh, having infrastructure that can support uh, health uh, uh, research questions in a, by protecting the personal data, the clinical data, and providing a good structure where, where things can really be researched uh, without having the ethical problems or any risk to the patients that very kindly donate their data to our further understanding of the brain. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, we have time for one more question, I think. Not seeing one in the room. Oh, right here. Hello. Yeah, thank you for your um, yeah, really interesting talk. And I personally am a big believer in using HPC for the, uh, you know, like the goals of neuroscience. Uh, but what I've kind of, I don't know, observed, experienced is that like like uh, a lot of researchers in neuroscience they don't write their own code mm -hmm. they rely on tools like you know FSL, AFNI that have already been written and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them are not adapted to you know like running something across multiple nodes you know just basic parallelization so what's your take on that do you think there's going to be a shift in, in that? So. I think in the HPP we have addressed this in different ways. Uh, on the one hand, we have provided training and education activities, workshops to all those users who have a certain degree of knowledge in compute and who are willing to go the extra mile to leverage the high performance computing infrastructure. So that has been one of the strategies. But on the other hand, we have, for example, 
clinicians who definitely won't have the time to sit down in a course to learn how MPI works and <laughs> or how to deploy a job on different nodes. So what we have done is really to try to provide user-friendly interfaces to them so that they can really just define the problem and we try to guesstimate which resources they will need. They will deploy things in the best manner possible and we try to provide a robust um, a space that can be monitored and debugged for the future so that um, our colleagues from the more computer science side or the engineering side can take a look and see, okay, are, these things are really working, it's uh, really translating the problem correctly, and we are efficiently using the infrastructure or not. So this has been the, the strategy. I think people are really eager to use supercomputing and they are getting more aware of what can be done. I always tell my colleagues, we need to inspire people to use HPC. I mean, there are so many things that you can do, but sometimes researchers don't have um, this in mind because they don't think it is even possible or they, they don't even go there. Uh, they think it's really hard or not treatable. But when you put it there and you give them examples, tangible examples, then they get inspired and they move into becoming HPC. <laughs> thank you so much. Let's once again thank our speaker. Okay. And we have a certificate for the speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much.